Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Brownlee. I am the adult program coordinator at the North Suburban YMCA. And in that role, I bring a variety of programs to adults in our community, including brain games, social networking opportunities, donation drives, and the adult education series, which you are attending today. It is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's fourth virtual adult education series program entitled Summertime Foot and Ankle Pain, hosted by orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Brian Waxman. Dr. Waxman is a board certified orthopedic surgeon who specializes in treating disorders of the foot, ankle, and knee, including sports injuries, trauma, and the various forms of arthritis. He also provides care for traumatic and sports related shoulder and elbow injuries. Dr. Waxman offers patients advanced treatments, including new techniques for meniscus repairs, ankle fusions, tendon transfers, and arthroscopic surgery, which reduces pain and speeds recovery times. Cheerful and easygoing, Dr. Waxman combines strong surgical abilities with good communication skills. In providing care, he looks at the patient as a whole, treating the person, not merely the orthopedic problem. One reviewer on healthgrades.com said of Dr. Waxman, outstanding, compassionate, kind, explained everything clearly, treated me with the utmost respect, did not rush, and did a great job with my broken leg and broken foot. He had to operate during a terrible, terrible pandemic. I would definitely refer new patients to Dr. Waxman. In addition to surgery, Dr. Waxman has expertise in, teeth in arthroscopy, fracture care, and independent medical evaluations. We also believe he will be great at explaining to you in a fun and disarming way that now is the time to prepare for summer to ensure your feet and ankles are strong and vital. We hope that you will gain a general understanding about how to manage pain in your foot and or ankle from Dr. Waxman's presentation today, and we hope to answer everyone's questions following his presentation. When you have a question to ask, please type them into the question section on your screen, and I will receive them and relay them to Dr. Waxman at the end of his presentation. Dr. Waxman has assured me that we, he will have plenty of time to provide answers to your questions. Again, thank you for joining us today, and now please sit back, relax, and enjoy Dr. Waxman's presentation, teaching you how to prevent and treat common injuries to the foot and ankle. Dr. Waxman, take it away. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking a little time out of what turned out to be a pretty nice uh, early summer afternoon, and we're gonna have a nice talk about just some common foot and ankle problems that we encounter in the spring and the summer. So we're gonna kind of take you everywhere from the ankle all the way down to little Miss Piggy in the toe and every place in between. So why are we out exercising in the spring and the summer? You know, some studies have shown that the average winter weight gain is about 4.5 pounds per person. Why is that? Generally speaking, there's two main reasons. Lack of sunlight actually leads to eating high calorie comfort foods. And then the cold weather leads to ditching exercise programs for the couch, often for binge watching on Netflix. This year though, this has been magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic. The 19 refers both to the year that the virus was discovered and the amount of weight that many people claim to have gained during the pandemic. It has led to closure of gyms, staying at home, and increased stress that itself leads to increased consumption, which of course leads to more weight gain. So as the days get longer and the weather warms up and the stay at home orders are relaxed, there's the desire to go out and get some sunshine and shed those extra pounds. This can lead to a whole host of injuries and painful conditions. So the big question is, does going outside and enjoying the nice weather inevitably lead to injury and pain? So what we're gonna talk about today are basically, what are the problems? What are the symptoms of those problems? How can you treat them? Can you prevent them? When should you seek medical care? And then I have a whole bunch of just common misconceptions that people have about some of these foot and ankle problems. Generally speaking, there's two types of issues that, that really come about as people go out and start to do things. You have injuries and then you have overuse problems. An injury, according to Webster, is an act that damages or hurts. The important point there is there is always a specific event. People remember when they got injured. Overuse, also according to Webster, is to do or use something too frequently or excessively. 
Conversely, unlike an injury, there's almost never a specific moment where the pain begins. I'll often have people come in and say, it just started to hurt. So that brings us to misconception number one. My foot hurts, so I must have had an injury. I just can't remember it. The reality is more people present with pain not associated with an injury than pain associated from an injury. So if you don't remember an injury, then there wasn't one. Um, but if there was an injury, there was. So you don't have to rack your brains to find the cause. Sometimes you can't really pinpoint it. So injuries, the most common injuries are one fracture, which is generally speaking a broken bone. You can break your ankle. The tarsal bones are just the bones in the middle part of the foot between the toes and the ankle. The metatarsals are the bones right before the toes. And the fifth metatarsal, which is uh, on the outside by the baby toe, is the one that's most frequently broken. And then you can break a toe. Another misconception, number two, is that a fracture is worse than a break. Um, the answer is no, a fracture is a break. A fracture is just simply the medical term that means broken bone. A lot of people, if I say, oh, you have a, you have a broken ankle, they'll say, oh, thank goodness, I thought it was gonna be fractured. Um, and it's always just one in the same. Sprain is the next uh, injury type. And a sprain typically refers to a ligament injury. And usually it's a partial tear of the ligament. Although in the more severe injuries, a complete tearing of the ligament can take place. The common places where one could sprain their ankle or sprain in the ankle and foot would be the ankle, which if you look at the picture here, that's the common description is I rolled my ankle. Um, a hind foot sprain is often confused with an ankle sprain because it really happens the same way, but it's the joint right underneath the ankle where the ligaments are injured. It kind of looks like a sprain, it behaves like a sprain, it feels like a sprain of the ankle, but in reality, it's the ligament of the joint underneath the ankle, not the ligaments of the ankle. A midfoot sprain is what it sounds like, a sprain in the middle part of the foot. That's the most serious one. You don't see it all that often, and it's probably more associated with sporting events, football, soccer, things like that. But it's, if you look at the picture over on the right, it's almost always with a foot, with the toes sort of on the ground, and your weight goes straight through the foot. And the injury is just in the ligaments in the middle part of the foot. This is actually potentially a really serious problem and sometimes actually requires surgery. But fortunately, it's fairly rare. And then we have forefoot injuries, which generally is, is a toe sprain. And that gets us to a rupture. A rupture just means a complete disruption. It usually refers to a tendon, and in the foot and ankle area, it's almost always the Achilles tendon, although there are some other tendons that can very occasionally get ruptured. So what are the symptoms of an injury? Generally, pain. It's always there. Either it's usually at the time of the event, although occasionally it can start just a few minutes after that, but it can worsen over time, and sometimes the next morning is when it's actually at its worst. But the key is there's always a moment and it always hurts there or soon after. Same thing with swelling. Usually it swells up right away, but sometimes it is a little bit delayed and the swelling can increase over the first 24 hours. And then weight bearing. Most of the time there's some difficulty bearing weight. Um, it can be immediate or it can be delayed. Much like pain, sometimes you can walk on it right away, but the next morning you cannot. So that gets us to our next misconception. It can't possibly be broken because I can walk on it. No, you can often walk on a broken ankle or foot. Conversely, you may not be able to walk on a very bad sprain. Treatment. Everybody's probably seen this mnemonic, RICE, R-I-C-E. Um, this applies not only to the foot and ankle, but really almost anything that hurts Think of rice and some, either all of the above or some of the above is the way to treat any injury or any painful condition that you could have, even in the upper extremity. So R stands for rest. This is far and away the most important thing. Other than the most severe injuries that require surgery, the body will tend to heal itself if you just let it and give it enough time. I always tell people, you got to be patient, patience, patience, patience. It always takes longer than you think for some of these injuries to get better. 
which brings us to our next misconception. All sprains get better in a few days. The answer is no. The minor ones do get better in a short amount of time, but the more severe sprains can take quite a bit longer and sometimes, you know, sometimes, you know, many months. Breaks generally take longer than sprains, but have a much narrower range. So if you look at this little graph, and this is about as scientific as we're going to get today, the, the, the area under the red line there would typically be your broken bones. They heal, but it's a very limited range. I mean, most broken bones are about six weeks, a little bit here or there. The, under the green or yellow line is going to be your sprain. It's a very broad range. So you could have an ankle sprain that gets better in two days, and then you could have ankle sprains that take six months to get better. So it's a very, very wide bell curve for a sprain and a very narrow one for a broken bone. So that brings us sort of back to this, but misconception number five, a break is worse than a sprain. The answer is not always. A bad sprain can be worse than a minor fracture. It can sometimes, sometimes take longer to heal and have more long-term problems. A bad fracture, however, trumps a bad sprain. I stands for ice. Ice is a topical anti-inflammatory treatment. Typically 15 to 20 minutes every hour is best. You can use ice, cold packs, even frozen peas work well. What ice does is it helps control the swelling which is really more about making it feel better than the actual healing. Although getting the swelling down does play some role in the healing process. Um, so now our next two misconceptions about ice. One is ice is only useful for the first 48 hours. No, ice is most important in the first 48 to 72 hours, but it's useful well beyond that. Um, you know, people frequently come into the office saying, oh, I iced it for the first couple of days. And then I stop, but their ankle or foot is still very swollen. As long as it's swollen, ice is going to be effective. Even weeks later, or months later, ice can be useful. It's just most important at the beginning to get the acute inflammation down. Next misconception, if some ice is good, more is better. Never do more than 20 minutes of ice at a time, as you can get frostbite. You don't think you can, but you can. And then the other point with ice is don't put ice directly on the skin you can actually paradoxically burn your skin with keeping ice directly on the skin. So although ice is a good thing, as they say too much of a good thing isn't always better. So then you've got C and E, compression and elevation. For compression, generally uh, the easiest thing at home is just an ACE wrap. You can wrap your foot or your ankle. Uh, figure of eight is a good technique. Elevation is just, it usually goes along with icing. If you're gonna put ice on something, try to prop it up. These two you know, modalities help to control the swelling. So now with the help of uh, two of my daughters, I'm gonna show you how to appropriately wrap an ankle. Okay, you can put, you can, you do. We're gonna show you how you appropriately wrap an ankle. You're gonna do a little figure of eight around the ankle and the foot. You're gonna go around the ankle like that. And that is how you wrap an ankle. So hopefully everybody saw that video. Um, that was my oldest daughter who was uh, temporarily home for uh, COVID quarantine uh, on the ankle modeling and my youngest daughter, Nicole, who was on the video. So injury prevention. Can injuries really be prevented? The answer to that is a really, really big no and a very, very small yes. Most outdoor injuries can really only be prevented by one, don't go outside, um, but really the same injuries that occur outdoors happen inside, or you can go with bubble wrap, but that's not very practical. But there are some things you can do to prevent injuries. Number one is appropriate shoes for the activity. Um, see a lot of injuries, people wearing flip-flops, playing soccer in flip-flops, running in flip-flops, all sorts of bad things happen in flip-flops. So you gotta wear the right shoe for the right activity. If you're going to walk, wear walking shoes. If you're going to run, wear running shoes. If you're going to play basketball, wear basketball shoes. That won't prevent every injury, but it certainly prevents some of them. And then this is my favorite, pay attention to your environment. 
someone once said, or a study showed that approximately 5,000 people yearly are injured while on their cell phones. And I would think it's more than that because I see a lot of people who get injured. And let's go back and hopefully again, this works on this. So you got to look where you're going. Um, it's so common people on cell phones will injure themselves. Uh, they it's not necessarily tripping into a fountain, but people step off of a curb and miss the curb. They step in a pothole because they're texting or they're doing things on their phone. So be aware of your environment. You're going to avoid again, can't avoid every injury, but you can you can kind of avoid the silly ones. So now we're going to get to overuse uh, issues. Uh, there's really a lot of overuse issues, but we're just going to talk about three of them today stress fractures, plantar fasciitis, and Achilles tendonitis. A stress fracture by definition is a fracture of a bone caused by repeated rather than a sudden mechanical stress. Generally, it occurs in the lower uh, extremity and foot as a result of walking, running, or jumping activities. Causes, there's two main causes of stress fractures. Doing the same activity too many days in a row without any rest. The example of that being running five miles, seven days a week or just as often it happens from too rapid and increased activities. So for example, if you're used to running or say walking three to four miles at a time and then decide to run or walk 10 miles one day, that rapid increase in mileage can cause a stress fracture. The symptoms of a stress fracture, generally speaking, are pain, but without a specific injury. Swelling, although not all the time, and it's seen more often than the foot than the ankle, and often, but not always, difficulty bearing weight. The most common places of stress fracture, you can see from this, about 80 plus percent of stress fractures are in the foot or the ankle. The other 18.7% are in other parts of the leg, up by the hip or in around the knee, but the overwhelming majority of them are in the ankle and foot. So the treatment of a stress fracture is rest, rest, rest. Again, these are kind of the same things over and over again, but they apply to all of the things. You gotta stop the activity that caused the pain until the pain is gone. Sometimes if it hurts enough, a brace or a walking boot might be required. Ice and NSAIDs and compression, they can't help the pain, but they don't fix the underlying problem. How do you prevent a stress fracture? Generally speaking, the most important thing is you got to slowly build up the activity. On the first nice day of the year, if you go out for a 10 mile walk when you've been sitting on the couch all winter, problems happen. So you just got to build yourself up. A good way to think about it is like a marathon runner. Nobody who is a marathon runner goes out and runs 26 miles the first time. They have a whole program to build themselves up to that level. You want to do the same thing with whatever activity you're doing. Start light and build up a little bit at a time. It's a great way to avoid all of these overuse injuries. Um, don't do the same activity every day. Don't run for more than five miles, or don't run more than five days in a row um, or five days a week. The body does need some rest. Um, a lot of people get into trouble because they go run or walk, you know five miles every day, day after day, week after week, eventually the body will start to break down. Then you gotta wear the appropriate shoes for the activity. Um, and then changing athletic shoes when they are worn out. So wearing a nice pair of basketball shoes to play basketball, good idea. Wearing a pair of worn out shoes like this to go for a long walk, not so much. So this brings us to a couple other misconceptions of just about shoes in general. One is you should change your running shoes every three to 500 miles. The answer is really no. The big shoe companies would have you believe that you need to change them every three to 500 miles, but there really is no exact mileage limit. There's a lot of factors, your weight, your foot shape, your running style, the surface that you're running on, all these sort of play a factor, but there's no set 300 miles, you gotta just buy a new pair of shoes. Kind of a good guideline is to change shoes when they no longer really feel comfortable, or if your feet are starting to ache after activity. The problem with shoes is the inner part of the shoe, the cushioning and the support that you can't see, wears out way before the visible outer part of the shoe. So again, sort of base it on how it feels, but you don't have to automatically get sh new shoes at a certain time. Next misconception is that the more expensive athletic shoes are better. And, and that's really not true at all. Lots of studies have shown that 
more expensive shoes are no better. And in some cases, they're actually even worse than less expensive shoes. I saw one once that said that the 10 most expensive shoes had a lower rating overall than the 10 least expensive shoes. So you want the appropriate shoes, but you know you do not have to spend $250 on a pair of running shoes. A good pair of running shoes for $50, $60 is probably adequate. Next is plantar fasciitis. What is plantar fasciitis? Plantar fasciitis is inflammation of the dense fibrous band on the bottom of the foot where it attaches to the heel. Most people just call it heel pain. But what is plantar, what it is not is this. It's not plantar fasciitis. I think the two things I probably hear the most that I get a little chuckle out of is one, people referring to heel pain as plantar fasciitis, has nothing to do with the peanuts. And then the other one is in the shoulder, you know, the rotary cuff as opposed to the rotator cuff. But it is not anything to do with peanuts and it's not a heel spur. Um, next misconception is I have a heel spur that is causing the pain. Plantar fasciitis is really just the inflammation of the fascia where it inserts into the bone of the heel. Sometimes there is a spur, but the spur itself does not cause the pain. The spur is not digging into the heel, which is sort of a common belief, but it's the result of the inflammation in that area. It's not the cause of the pain. Some people have pain with no spur. Some people have a spur with no pain. And just from a historical point of view, like 120 years ago when x-rays were first developed, they x-rayed heels and they saw a spur and they just assumed that it was a sharp spur that was digging into the tissues causing pain. Over the years, we've determined that the spur is a radiographic finding, has nothing to do with it, and we don't treat the spur itself. Symptoms of plantar fasciitis. Pain in the morning with the first steps out of bed. Um, or after long periods of sitting, which improves after walking. If you don't have this, you don't have plantar fasciitis. There are other causes of heel pain. Um, one of them is the rare stress fracture of the heel, which will hurt in the same area, but it generally does not hurt when you first get out of bed, but it will hurt as you, pro you know, progressively do more walking. There is no swelling, and generally you're able to bear weight, Maybe the first couple steps in the morning it hurts, but there's no, after that weight bearing is not uh, a problem at all. Treatment. Probably more treatment options for plantar fasciitis than almost any other foot condition. Once again, rest, rest, rest. It's okay to participate in non-weight bearing activities like biking or swimming, but you gotta rest until the symptoms are completely resolved. 80% just isn't good enough. And this is kind of the look I always get when I see someone ask if they're still in a lot of pain, if they can go out and run a 10K race. So this gets us to our next misconception. I thought if I kept running, it would just simply work itself out. The answer is no. Pain is your body's way of telling you there is something wrong. It is best to listen. Everyone remembers their high school coach, no pain, no gain, or their trainer at the gym. No, you got to work through it. No pain, no gain. That really only applies to sore muscles. It does not apply to pain. Pain anywhere is really your body's way of telling you that there's something you got to pay attention to. The sooner you address it, the sooner it goes away. Next misconception. My pain was almost gone, so I thought it was okay to resume. No. Going back too soon, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. The condition will just flare up. The quickest way to make all of these overuse conditions chronic is to go back when you're 75% better. So here's another video. The next way of treatment is ice massage. Let's hope that this works and we're gonna go back to the, this screen. So this is a good, small uh, bottle of water that has been in the freezer and is frozen solid. Place it on the floor and roll your foot over it. You can put quite a lot of pressure onto the bottle Roll from the ball of your foot right to the heel. Continue this for about 10 minutes. Repeating this every hour will give you the best results, but even twice a day will make a difference. You can also ice the plantar fascia by putting your foot into a bowl filled with water and a few cubes of ice for around about 10 minutes every hour. But of course, this method doesn't massage the plantar fascia, although some people prefer it.
And okay. Stretching. Um, in the morning, right when you get up, and then multiple times throughout the day, 10 times a day for 30 to 60 seconds is much better than once a day for 10 minutes. So these pictures here show pretty much all the different techniques. Since it really is pretty painful when you get up in the morning, this one here on the left, getting a, a robe sash or a belt or a tie and pulling the toes back, even before you get up and go to the bathroom, stretch that out for about 30 seconds. Then these other three ways are ways to stretch it throughout the day. You can lean up against the wall. And typically when you're stretching for plantar fasciitis and then later for Achilles tendonitis, you're really stretching the calf out. The calf and the Achilles and the muscle tendon is connected to the plantar fascia. So when you stretch out the calf, you really are stretching out the plantar fascia. So you can lean up against the wall to do it. You can let your foot hang over the so uh, uh, stair. If you go up and down the stairs, you can stop for 30 seconds and let it just hang. Um, the slant board is a good way, but that requires actually getting a slant board. Um, they have them at gyms, but these other ways work just as well. Um, if you want to get something like that, they're pretty cheap on Amazon, but these other ways are, are more than adequate. The key with stretching, again, multiple times throughout the day, not once a day. Inserts, both cushioned heel inserts and orthotics can be useful too. I tend to like the little cushioned inserts here on the right um, for two reasons. One is they're pretty cheap. Uh, they are easy to move from shoe to shoe and they work pretty well. Orthotics work well too. Um, there's different types of orthotics you can get. If you're gonna go that route, I recommend don't really get the Dr. Scholl's from Walgreens. Those ones are kind of cheap. I recommend going to like a good shoe store like uh, the Walking Company or Running Rider, or New Balance, any good shoe store, athletic shoe store where you could step on a little monitor or a sensor. It'll take an image of your foot and it'll kind of spit out an over-the-counter orthotic. Those tend to be about $50 or $60. Um, and those are pretty good. Custom orthotics work well too, but they're expensive. They're four or $500 for a pair of custom orthotics. They're not always covered by insurance and these other less expensive ways work just as well. Other ways to treat it, once if it's not getting better, physical therapy can be effective. Occasionally we'll do some cortisone injections. Plantar fascia night splint, which you can see in the upper right there, that helps with the morning pain. It keeps it stretched out overnight. It is effective. Some people just can't tolerate sleeping with something like that on, but if you can, it works pretty well. And then surgery, it's rare. Um, maybe 1% at the most of people with plantar fasciitis eventually need surgery. And it's really after they've exhausted the other seven options. Um, it's really never an option right off the bat, but occasionally it is done. You know, I'll see hundreds of people with plantar fasciitis and the number of surgeries per year I do for it is it's just a handful, but consistently it does need to get done. How do you prevent it? Much like everything else, don't overdo it. Don't do high impact exercising every day. Wear the appropriate shoes for the activity. One different thing though is unlike an injury, once you've recovered from it, you gotta be careful that it doesn't recur. So many people who have these overuse conditions get them from doing a specific activity that they enjoy doing, and as soon as they get better, they go back and they do the same activity. Um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, you wanna go back to the activity, but you don't want the problem to come back. So once it's gone, particularly for plantar fasciitis, you gotta keep stretching. You know, it's very important to keep stretching even when it's resolved. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then don't return to the activity too quickly or vigorously. Again, much like how you should go at the beginning of the summer, build up slowly. Don't don't go under the thought of, boy, I took three months off of this. Let's go out and run 10 miles today. Almost guarantee you're gonna be back in the office complaining. The final thing we're gonna talk about is Achilles tendonitis. Tendonitis in general, but Achilles tendonitis is inflammation of the Achilles tendon or the sheath that surrounds the tendon. Pain can either be in the middle of the tendon, which typically is in a slightly younger age demographic, usually under the age of 40. As you get a little bit older, the problem is a little lower down where the tendon attaches to the bone. There's sometimes, but not always pain in the morning. And unlike some of these other conditions, you're actually often able to do the activity. The pain often will really kind of kick in when you're done. 
sometimes, especially if it's a little higher up in the tendon, you'll notice that there's some thickening of the tendon or it feels like there's a little nodule. And unlike some things that can happen like stress fractures and plantar fasciitis just from walking, usually Achilles tendonitis is from slightly higher impact activities, runners, jumpers, tennis players, and the like. Next misconception. I hear this one all the time. In fact, almost anyone who comes in with Achilles tendon pain will ask, ask this question. If I have pain in my Achilles tendon, is it about to snap? And the answer is a resounding no. Having a tendonitis does not equate to a rupture. In fact, it is almost unheard of to rupture an Achilles tendon that has pre-existing pain in it. The reason being, if you have pain, you're probably not doing the activities that would cause it to rupture. But in 20 odd years of doing this, I've seen one ruptured tendon in someone who had any pre-existing Achilles tendon issues. And ironically, once their tendon, after they had surgery and it healed, their pre-existing Achilles pain was resolved. All of the other ones, which is hundreds, nobody ever had pre-existing issues. A rupture is, is an acute event. It's not related to overdoing it and overdoing it does not predispose you to it. Like everything else, the treatment starts with rest, 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 rest. Generally, you just have to stop the offending activity. Occasionally though, if it hurts enough, we'll immobilize it in a walker boot. Ice can be effective. And unlike some of the other conditions, some of these topical anti-inflammatory medications like Voltaren gel can be pretty effective. Voltaren gel was a prescription medication until, I mean, just in the last few months. Now it's over the counter, which makes it a whole lot easier. Um, and what it is, it's, it's Voltaren, which is like an ibuprofen medicine in a cream. It works particularly well in areas of the body that don't have a lot of muscle or fat. So in the hands and the feet, I find it very effective for some conditions. It's applied two to three times daily, again, in conjunction with rest and ice and things of that sort. Just using Voltaren gel alone is not going to solve the problem. Again, rest, rest, rest. Stretching, same stretches for plantar fasciitis. Heel lifts um, can be effective too, but this is more of a quarter inch heel lift and not a cushioned insert that we use for plantar fasciitis. They sort of look the same, um, but you want more of a solid heel wedge that lifts the heel up. It doesn't have to be cushioned. Physical therapy uh, and surgery are options. Therapy we do if it doesn't respond to the above. Surgery also fairly rare, um, and typically it's for insertional tendonitis or the tendonitis that's at uh, where it hooks into the bone. How do you prevent it? And if, if I'm sounding like a broken record at this point, it's because I probably am. Wear the appropriate shoes and don't overdo it. Um, don't do the activity too many days in a row and don't increase the activity too quickly. Also, stretching before and after exercise helps prevent tendonitis. That doesn't really apply much to stress fractures. Um, plantar fasciitis stretching is important, and stretching doesn't prevent most injuries either. Like broken bones just happen whether you're stretched out or not. So one of the other points we talked about is when do I go see the doctor? Um, people come in the often all the time asking, did I come too soon? Did I wait too long? So you know, the question is, when should you go see a doctor? Generally speaking, there's two circumstances that require a visit. Number one and number two are probably one and the same. Um, if you're in severe pain, there's probably something either that's either A, wrong and needs to be identified, or at the very least needs to be treated so that it'll get better. Severe pain does not imply that it's broken. Again, someone with a bad sprained ankle could have much more pain than a simple broken ankle. In fact, sometimes people come in like that day with a bad sprained ankle, but come in five days later with a broken ankle. And then if you're unable to bear weight on the extremity, you should definitely have it looked at to rule out anything that's really very serious, but also to get treated. If you can't bear weight on it, a lot of times just either putting a brace on it, getting a walker boot will allow you to walk on it. Crutches kind of seem cool when you're like 10 years old, but most people, if you've been on crutches as an adult, you need to have a lot of upper body strength and it really starts to hurt the arms. So people are so happy when they come in, you know, if they've been using crutches and we give them a boot and let them walk out. Um, and then the other is kind of, uh, is the other reason people come in is the symptoms don't resolve within a reasonable amount of time. And this is variable. There are people that come in 
a day or two after something starts to hurt because they just have to know what's going on. On the other hand, there's people that wait six months. They figure, well, I thought it would get better. I thought it would get better. And six months or a year goes by and it's not gone. And then they finally come in. There's no right answer to that. When you feel that you've given it a reasonable time or you're concerned about it, have it looked at. And it, there is never a problem having it looked at. Even sometimes it's just for your own peace of mind. People will come in and say, I just want to make sure it wasn't broken. Um, and they're just happy to, you know, to get that information. So misconception number 13, um, if I have pain or an injury, I cannot do any activity. No, just alter what you do. Avoid the aggravating activity, but it's perfectly okay to do other things. For example, if you have a stress fracture in the foot or plantar fasciitis, you're not going to want to get on the treadmill. You're not going to want to go for long walks or run, but it's okay to bike and swim. You just want to avoid the weight-bearing activities. So in summary, and if you take one thing from this entire talk, it's this. Wear the appropriate shoes. This is just a great little, I don't want to go over everything in this slide here, but this sums up what, how bad flip-flops are for anything more than going to the beach or walking to the shower. Um, and just on Monday, just two days ago, I had two different people came in with injuries related to shoe choice. One woman broke her toe because she was out walking in flip-flops and something happened and she jammed her fifth toe and broke it. And then uh, a, a young lady decided to walk 26 mile marathon in a pair of old shoes and came in with probably a stress fracture. So if there's any one message to take home, wear the right shoes for the right activity. Flip-flops, they look good, but they're not, a, they're not anything to do exercise or do activities with. Don't do too much too quickly. If something starts to hurt, stop the activity. Our old friend Rice, and again, it's our rest, I, ice, C, compression, E, elevation. That applies to the foot and the ankle. It applies to the knee. It applies to the shoulder. It applies to the hand. Anything you do, if you remember Rice, that's a good treatment starting point um, you know, before you seek help if you need it. And then seek care if severe pain or the pain does not resolve. So with that, I want everyone to enjoy the summer and then just one final message. So if there are any other questions or concerns or for those who insist upon running in their flip-flops, this is how I can be reached. So I wanted to thank everybody for listening. My families and my dogs say thank you as well. All right, Dr. Waxman, are you ready for the many questions? I am ready. Let me see, All let me right. get back to this. Okay, good. Okay, fire away. fire away. All right, here we go. With plantar fasciitis, do you recommend wearing Birkenstocks or other arch supporting shoes around the house, even when you're not having symptoms anymore? Um, well, once your symptoms have resolved around the house, you probably don't have to do that. Um, but while you're having symptoms, yes, I think, you know, Birkenstocks are a good supportive shoes. They have an arch built in. And then the other issue is just what you're walking on. If you're walking on a carpeted floor, probably doesn't matter. Even when you have plantar fasciitis, walking on a on carpet usually isn't very painful at all. Good to know. Okay. And someone else asks, will this be available to review again later? Would like my sister to see this. And I can answer that one. I don't know if you know the answer. Well, Dr. I, think it, I just don't know how. Yes, yes, it will be available on both IBJI's website and on the North Suburban YMCA's website. So, okay, the next question, what shoes are bad? Well, I learned flip-flops. Flip-flops are bad. Yeah, there's a couple things about shoes. Um, one is if you put on, a, when you go and buy shoes, any shoe, whether it's athletic shoes or just regular shoes, um, it's got to feel good when you put them on. Okay, people think like anything else, if I, I, they're a little tight, but I'll get them, they'll stretch out and they'll feel better. If it doesn't feel good when you try on the shoe, it's a bad shoe, you don't get it. If you have difficulty with shoes, you gotta, you know, don't just go to you know, a place where you just pick them off a shelf and try them on. Go to a good shoe store where they can you know, check the width of your foot and the length of your foot. Because if you have a wider foot, you're gonna need a wider shoe. If you try to get a narrow shoe on, it's gonna cause problems. That said, you know, some people like support in their shoes, some people don't. It's not that you have to have a, you know, an arch built into the shoe. Some people like it, some people don't. 
Yeah, but the most important thing is just wear the right shoe for the right activity and make sure the shoe feels good. If it feels bad, it is bad. Good advice. Thank you. What types of exercises should you do to strengthen your ankle after a sprain? Uh, excellent question. Um, on your own, probably the easiest thing to do is kind of range of motion, which is just going in a circle both ways. And then the far and away the best is the letters of the alphabet. Um, you can draw out the letters of the alphabet, you know, A, B, C with your foot. And what that's going to do, because when you're rehabbing an ankle sprain, the ligament's just going to heal itself. I mean, the exercises don't, you know, heal the ligament. What you're doing is you're strengthening the muscles around the ankle to help support the ankle. So if you just, and if just try it while you're sitting there listening to me, um, if you just do A, B, C, D, E, F, G with your foot, A, it's, you realize you need some coordination to do that but you're gonna to start to feel it. And those are muscles you're not used to strengthening. So you know, when people come into the office and most people don't need physical therapy after ankle sprains, that's what I tell them. I show them the ABCs, you can do it in any language you want. You can do songs, whatever, any which way you wanna do it. Those kind of circular motions help strengthen the muscles. Great, thank you. What is the best treatment for a strained Achilles and how is it assessed? You've talked about this a little bit, but I figured if there's anything else you want to add. Um, well, the best, I mean, so now it depends on did your Achilles just hurt or did you, or did you injure your Achilles? Because sometimes you can strain your Achilles and it's actually an injury. Um, if that's the case, more often than not, we have to immobilize or we put you in a walking boot. If your Achilles just hurts, you know, you've been running or playing basketball and you just have some pain, We'll usually use those little quarter inch heel lifts, icing it and resting it with some stretching. If that doesn't get it better, then we go do physical therapy. Um, if you're having a lot of pain to walk, then we'll put you in a walking boot. But again, if it's an injury, it's gonna require a little bit different treatment than if it's just sort of painful. So a, a strain usually implies that there's an injury versus tendonitis, which is more just overdoing it. That yeah, makes sense. What do you recommend wearing in the house for flat feet? We are all spending more time inside, just socks or an inside shoe? It depends. If you have no problems with your feet, then you can wear whatever you want. I mean, you know, back in the old days, you always hear people, they couldn't get into the army because they had flat feet because they thought that having flat feet was a problem, but it, it isn't. If you look at all comers, some people have flat feet, you know, some people have normal arches and some people have very high arches. Having flat feet and no symptoms, do nothing. Don't start wearing orthotics if you have flat feet, if they don't hurt. Because once you start using orthotics or inserts, it's impossible to get rid of them. A lot of times you're just stuck wearing them indefinitely because your foot sort of adapts to having that support. If you have painful conditions that require it, then it's a good thing. But yeah, if you have no pain and flat feet, ignore it. Just get on with your life and don't pay any attention. Good, good. All right. Um, someone's asking, is it okay to go on long walks with Achilles tendonitis and what shoes are best? You kind of again address that, but I figure if there's anything else you want to add. Yeah, I mean, it's, a lot of it depends on whether walking hurts it. So, you know, the bottom line is you know, the old thing you see in a cartoon, well, doctor, it hurts when I do this. You know, they're moving their arm up and down. Well, don't do that. Um, so if you're getting, if you have Achilles tendon ice because you're running, you stop the running. But if walking does not hurt, then it's okay to walk. And then as far as shoes, probably more of a heel lift. That heel wedge for Achilles tendonitis is going to be more effective than an arch support anyway. Um, the other key with any activity is the times you have to be careful. If it hurts when you're doing it, it's pretty obvious you should stop doing it. But if you do an activity and it hurts a lot when you're done, and, and tendonitis often behaves that way, you can go out and run. It seems like it loosens up, but as soon as you're done, it really starts to hurt. Then you got to stop the activity. So again, if walking doesn't hurt to walk, and when you're done, it doesn't hurt anymore, then you can walk for exercise. But if it hurts to walk or it hurts right when you're done, then probably get on the bike or swim or you know do something else until it gets better. Great, that makes a lot of sense. This person asks, is there such a thing as shin splints? And if so, why and how? Yes, shin splints are sort of an inflammation on the where the muscles attach into the tibia, which is the shin bone. 
it's an inflammation. So um, it's, it's again, it's also from overuse. The one thing about shin splints, and especially if you're a runner, is shin splints and stress fracture of the tibia, they, they present very, very similarly. It's the same pain. Um, the difference is at least, and for me, it's, it's easier to sort of differentiate, but on your own, shin splints are more diffusely up and down the shin. So if the entire shin bone, when you touch it hurts, that's usually more shin splints. A stress fracture of the tibia, which actually is a big deal, it's usually a very small area. So if you, the top of the shin doesn't hurt and the bottom by the ankle doesn't hurt, but right in the middle, it's very painful, that might be a stress fracture and that needs to be looked at because that's a potentially big problem. But shin splints do exist. They're inflammation of the kind of muscle as it hooks into the bone. And the treatment is similar to a lot of these overuse conditions. You rest from the activity that bothers it. You ice it down. Heat sometimes helps with, um, with shin splints. Um, sometimes inserts in the shoes. Physical therapy can help. But it's self-limited. It eventually will go away if you rest it. Um, but it is real. It is a real condition. Thank you. Do, do shin splints cause stress fractures in the shins? No. Different thing. No. Um, totally much, yeah, a, a stress fracture, it, 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 a good way to think of a stress fracture is the, the even though you, you don't think of it, but bone is actually like living. You know, there's blood cells and arteries and stuff going through the bone. So when you exercise, your bone breaks down. So if you run a lot or you walk a lot, you're breaking the bone down. When you, yeah, so you're breaking the bone down. When you rest, you're you're allowing the bone to build itself back up. If you break the bone down faster than you can build it up, eventually you're going to get a stress fracture. Um, gotcha. But that's a true bone injury. I mean, it really is. It's an, but shin splints is it just it's it's not really tendonitis because it's the fascia, but it's almost like a muscular overuse condition. But one does not. It feels the same, and a lot of people can't differentiate the same on their own. Um, but it's completely different. You don't get shin splints from a stress fracture. You don't get a stress fracture from shin splints. Good to know. Thank you. All right, we're back to shoes. I heard it is better to try on shoes later in the day so your foot is at its largest due to swelling at the end of the day. Is that true? Oh, if you're buying shoes? Um, yeah. It depends. It, is, it depends what time of year. I mean, in the summertime, I think most people's feet swell a little bit at the end of the day. Um, and that kind of probably depends a little on your age. Very young people, probably there's no difference. Um, but if you if you notice that your feet are swollen at the end of the day, then you want to you want to do two things. I mean, it's complicated because if you if you if your foot swells a lot at the end of the day, and you buy a shoe that's for that size of your foot, if you put it on in the morning, it's too big. Yeah. So if you if you most people their foot size doesn't fluctuate all that much. But if it does, then you might have to have a pair of shoes that you're going to wear in the morning to go out and a pair of shoes you're going to wear at the end of the day. Um, but most people, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Okay, this is kind of a long one. I have weakness in my foot and ankle, and if I try to stand on that one foot, my balance is very poor. I hear and feel popping sounds. There is discomfort in that foot, and I have poor forward motion when trying to walk. Any idea what might be the cause of this? This has been a chronic condition for me, or do you have any suggestions on how I can treat this? That's a tough question. I mean, because that's one that you probably would have to have it looked at, because it could be a lot of different things. I mean, there are certain tendon disorders that are chronic conditions that cause some weakness and make it harder to roll over and walk normally, arthritis in certain parts of the foot. Um, and it, it would be really hard to even make a recommendation for what you could do or what it could be, because it really could be so many different things. I would say if it's chronic and bothersome, get it looked at. I mean, the, easy, yeah. the best thing if you're unsure what to do and if it's going on long enough and it bothers you enough, get it looked at. I mean, let someone who knows what they're doing take a look at it and they can give you some good suggestions. Great, great, yeah, good, good answer. Very, very, if you, that's one of those, when do you need to see a doctor? That's one of the times. Yeah, you get, right. you have to, like, get the person, something's been going on for like four years. Um, that's probably the time you should have it looked at. Um, <laughs> but I mean, there are people that just self-treat and, and that's fine. I mean, there are people that come in the day they injure themselves. They don't even give it overnight and that's okay too. It's just what your individual comfort level is. Some people just have to know the answer. And 
I tell people all the time, yeah, you because know, people will call and they'll come in and say, I think I have bone cancer or something like that for some condition. Yeah. And that that's so rare that ever happened. And and in all honesty, I've only seen a few in 20 years. But people come in for peace of mind. You know, they're worried they have something, they're worried a bone is broken and they just want to know. And, and part of what we do is just provide reassurance. We treat things, but some of what we do is just give you a little peace of mind. That's good to know. All right, here's another one. I have been treated for plantar fasciitis for a while. It got better and then got worse. I've had two stem cell shots. The second one seems to have worked better, but I have done tons of therapy at home, including calf stretching, ice bottle twice a day, and even rolling the calf on a pipe. I am now up to running again. If I don't keep up the therapy, my heel pain starts to come back. I have custom orthotics too. What else do you recommend for strengthening and so forth? Well, it sounds like you've done almost everything you can do. Um, I mean, you've got the orthotics, you've done you've done stem cells, which is, you know, I didn't even mention stem cells in there because there are a couple of things like stem cells and PRP, which is another injection that are not covered by insurance. And stem cells are very expensive. PRP is not quite as expensive, but I mean, this is one of those, you remember I said about 1% of people with plantar fasciitis might need, eventually need surgery. I mean, it sounds like that might be someone who eventually has to at least look into that. Um, I mean, we'll often at that point get an MRI just to see what the fascia looks like, make sure there's nothing in the bone that's going on. But you know, at this point, it's just kind of doing the same things over and over again. Um, there's a limit to how many shots you really want to give. But that's someone who might have to start thinking about either A, stop running, um, yeah. or B, if they want to keep running, you might have to look into trying to, to fix the problem. There's actually a lot of professional athletes that have had plantar fascia surgery. Um, you know, I don't know if, when I was a fellow, I did a paper on one of those, and, and Mark McGuire was actually one of the you know athletes that uh, had two surgeries for plantar fasciitis by the guy I did my fellowship with, which is why I ended up writing the paper. But no, occasionally people do need surgery; they don't respond to anything else, and and th that might that might be the one percent. All right, that's good to know. All right, here's another one. I have ankle arthritis and recently had a bone bruise, which took three months to heal. Now, there are times when I step in an awkward way and can't walk on that part of my foot, or excuse me, on that foot for a few days without pain. Any suggestions to help this situation? Well, it depends on how bad the arthritis is. Um, I mean, there's two issues. A bone bruise usually implies that there was some sort of an injury. So the question is, did the bone bruise actually heal? Um, I'm guessing they had an MRI because that's the only way you can really see a bone bruise. So sometimes you have to go back and get another MRI to see if it's resolved. If it is resolved, then you're left with the underlying arthritis that's the problem. And what you do for arthritis of the ankle depends on you know, how bad the arthritis is. I mean, there's, there's different options. Cortisone injections are pretty effective for arthritic ankles. If it's very mildly arthritic and there's like just a bone spur in the front, you can sometimes some minor arthroscopic surgery to remove that spur can be effective. Um, if it's just terrible, you know, bone on bone arthritis, that's when, you know, depending on your age, you have to think about an ankle replacement or a you know, much bigger reconstructive surgery. But first thing is see if the bone bruise is resolved and then you, the different ways to treat the underlying arthritis. But I'd suggest that they go back to see whoever they were seeing or see somebody if they're having that much difficulty to try to figure out why. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, here's another one. I have a callus and terrible pain on the ball of my foot. I have had the problem for approximately 30 years, and in the past, podiatrists have filed it down. A student at Dr. Scholl's School of Podiatry cut it out. I normally teach line dancing four days a week, ballroom dance, and square dance weekly. I need my feet. What course of treatment would you suggest? Well, there's probably only two options. I mean, this has been going on for 30 years, so Generally speaking, something that's going on for 30 years isn't going to go away on its own. Um, but calluses are from pressure. That's that's if you if you lift weights and you get calluses on your hands, that's just from pressure. So calluses on the feet are from pressure from where the bone kind of contacts the ground or, or or your shoe. And there's only really two ways you have to unload that pressure. Some orthotics can help depending on where in the bottom of your foot it is. Um, you can get an orthotic with different metatarsal pads or things of that sort 
or sometimes you have to unload it from the inside. So you, you have to address the bone. If the bone is sort of malaligned or there's a problem with the bone, you have to correct the bony issue, which sort of solves the problem on a more permanent basis. Orthotics can help, but they only help as long as you wear them. You know, wearing them for a month isn't going to fix the problem. If it helps, you just got to wear them forever. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Are itching and pain in the toes a sign of gout, especially the itching? Uh, no and yes. Itching is not gout. Um, pain is a sign of gout, but anyone who's had gout knows what gout feels like. It's awful. It's one of the, for something, you wouldn't think a, a toe could hurt that much, but people that have gout are sweating in pain. I mean, it is incredibly painful. So if you just have some pain, it's not gout. I mean, it's just simply not. Um, it, itching has nothing to do with gout at all. So gout is extremely painful. It's swollen, it's red, and it's warm. And it's you get treatment fast. I mean, especially if you've never had it before and you don't know what it is, you go to the doctor immediately because you can't wait a day. People that have had it sometimes have medicine around that they can start taking for it. But itching, if it's itching and a little bit of pain, it's not gout. Good to know, good to know. Do you have any tips on how to avoid tripping and falling when on an outside walk? Well, like my little video showed, look where you're going. I mean, that's probably the most important thing. I, you know, that 5,000 number is just a number I found. It's way more than that because I see a lot of people every year that, you know, get injured on their cell phone. Um, look where you're going. I mean, people, they, it's not even the silly things like a phone. People are, are running and they're on their phones or they're listening to music and not looking and they step off the curb that they don't see. Um, so yeah, look where you're going. And then again, the right shoes. If you have the wrong shoe, like some sandals, and I'll, I'll do this, and everyone does, you're walking and, you're, and your foot kind of catches on the ground and it sticks. Yep. Um, and a lot of times that's just the shoe. Um, and you can't always avoid those, but flip-flops and sandals are terrible to walk in. They start to come off your feet and then you step awkwardly. Um, but I'd say the right shoes and look where you're going. If you really are falling and tripping a lot, the only other thing you would want to look into is, I mean, do you have any sort of balance issue? Um, and this is probably more addressed as people get older. Um, and older is probably over 75. A lot of people have balance problems. They just, they have trouble walking, they trip a lot. If that's the case, there's actually therapy that can be done that can address a you know, balance disorder. As I always tell people, you know, any age, but especially as people get older, any fall is potentially a really bad fall. So if you can avoid them, avoid them. Great, great. And then there's another question along the same lines. I'm 82 years old and find that my, that my ankles are weak when I try balance exercises on one foot. Are there recommended exercises to strengthen the ankle? Uh, well, I mean, I think, so. I mean, on your own, kind of those letters of the alphabet exercises, a lot of it also depends, especially at 82, what, you know, is there some arthritic problem? Is there certain tendon conditions that you can get as you get a little bit older that you would require different sort of therapy? Um, but generally on your own, letters of the alphabet works for almost anything. Beyond that, probably is best to have a therapist or, you know, you can see a doctor and let them look, but a physical therapist can, you know, you've seen people with like the stretchy little colored bands um, for rehabbing different parts of their body. Those are, each color band is just a different kind of resistance. So you can use those and use that resistance to strengthen and, and you know, put it up against the door and go in and out and up and down. And that'll actually strengthen it well too. But if you're gonna go that route, it might be a good idea to see a therapist. Um, the one thing I'll say about doing exercises is doing exercises the wrong way is almost worse than not doing them at all. So you, if you're gonna do any sort of therapy exercise, make sure you're doing it correctly. Um, nowadays, you can get a YouTube video for almost anything if you don't wanna go into a therapist, but um, you just wanna make sure you're doing them correctly before you start doing them. Yes, good point. So we are at four o'clock. We do still have more questions. I don't know how much time you're willing to give. I don't wanna hold you over. Questions that need to be answered. All right, all right, fair enough, thank you. Okay, I'm training for a marathon and have had some ankle discomfort. I ice my ankle several times a day. What other the things what other things can I do to get my ankle back to 100% so that I can run long distances again with no com no discomfort? Also, what ankle braces do you recommend to wear to protect my ankle from further damage? 
That's a tough one because it depends on how much it hurts. I mean, if it really hurts a lot, you got to stop running. I mean, you know, it's you're not going to be able to if you're just training for the marathon. It's going to be in in October, meaning you're sort of at the beginning of the you know of the program, and it's already hurting now. I think you got to take a step back and make it figure out why is it hurting, and then get it to stop, not try to run through it. I, I think that's number one is you just have to stop. Um, and then it depends where the pain, pain is coming from, because ankle pain could be coming from the joint. It could be tendonitis. You know, physical therapy might be effective. Bracing for running, I don't think you're going to want to wear an ankle brace for 26 miles. I, I, I think that's the wrong way about going to treat it. I think you got to you know, solve the problem and then start running. Um, but the starting point is stop. Stop the running, figure out why it hurts, then, then get back into it. Thank you. Makes a lot of sense. How often can you get a cortisone injection? Depends. Um, it depends what you're treating and, and how old you are. In, in an arthritic joint, if you have terrible arthritis in the joint, you can get as many shots as the doctor is willing to give you. Normally, I won't do more than three a year because you're not going to really cause any damage. Cortisone into a healthy joint it causes, can actually damage the cartilage. So. If you're a young athlete and your ankle hurts or your knee hurts and you keep getting cortisone shots so you can participate, that buildup of cortisone is going to actually damage the cartilage and might lead to arthritis, which is probably why you see so many ex-professional football players that can barely walk by the time they're 35. Yeah. Um, in those circumstances, one or two shots maximum, and then you got to figure out what's going on to try to fix the problem. And then the other issue is age-related. You know, if you're if you're 90 years old and you have ankle arthritis or you have almost any problem, in all honesty, you're not too concerned about what's going to happen 10 or 15 years down the road if you're giving an extra injection. If you're 35 years old, you actually are concerned because if you inject too many times into certain areas, you're going to actually cause more problems than you're going to than you're going to solve. And then just one more thing about injections, because I didn't really talk too much in particular. We never inject tendons in the lower part of the body. You can inject plantar fasciitis because that's not really a tendon. You cannot inject into the Achilles tendon. You cannot inject into the other main tendons. It can actually weaken the tendon and cause it to rupture. So if, and if you ever see anyone and they recommend an, an injection into your Achilles tendon, head for the hills. That is a very bad idea. Good to know. Thank you. How long should one wear a boot with a fifth metatarsal break uh it it depends on where the break is um there's there's a what's something called a jones fracture which if you watch professional sports and you ever hear about someone who says or you hear on tv he had a screw put in his foot that's almost always for a certain fifth metatarsal fracture that's rare but those require long-term immobilization most other fractures in the foot, you're treating for symptoms. So the bone is going to heal regardless of whether you wear the boot. You're wearing the boot because it feels good. So you know if you have an avulsion fracture at the base of the fifth metatarsal, which if you remember that one foot fracture, that's the common yeah. place. We usually will put people in a boot, but if they feel better, they can start getting into a regular shoe whenever they want. But most people feel more comfortable in the boot for a month or so. Um, but it's not a set amount of time. You can go without a boot from the get-go and just hobble around on it, and it's still going to heal. You're just going to deal with more pain. The boot is just making it, it's relieving the symptoms. The bone will heal independent of anything else you do. Good to know. That's, that's really interesting. Thank you. The next question is, how, how is arthritis diagnosed? Generally on an x-ray, um, most of the time you can see on a plain old simple radiograph in the office. Because um, arthritis, there's different things you see on an x-ray. They'll have bone spurs. You know, when someone says they have a bone spur, that's usually a sign of arthritis. Um, the joint space gets narrowed. So kind of another kind of misconception, probably more with the knee than anything else, is people say, oh, my knee hurts. It feels like bone on bone. You know, bone on bone just means when you get a standing x-ray, the bones are like touching each other versus the normal space in between them. So if you get an x-ray and you see that the space of the joint is narrowed down from where it is, what takes up that space is the cartilage. So when the cartilage is gone, the bones look closer together. 
And that's usually what you're looking for. You know, joint space narrowing and spur formation on an X-ray is, is, is probably the best way. Um, an MRI will pick it up, but we rarely get an MRI to diagnose arthritis. It's a kind of an, it's an overpriced diagnostic tool for that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Does having flat feet put you at greater risk for ankle and foot injury? My husband has custom orthotics, years or had custom orthotics years ago, but they no longer fit. His feet and angles tend to roll inward. Would an OTC orthotic help some? It might, like I mentioned before, just having flat feet in and of itself isn't a big deal. And people who've had flat feet their entire life, if they don't have any problems, it's really not worth getting orthotics um, or anything. It's just not worth treating. And now if you're starting to have issues, that's a different story. I mean, if you're starting to have pain, sometimes you become progressively more flat footed as you get older. Um, and um, there, maybe that put a light on. Um, you know, if you're getting more flat footed and having issues, then getting an orthotic to support the foot can be effective. But I think you have to take each individual case. Um, if he had orthotics before and they were effective, then I think getting an over-the-counter orthotic is good. Um, but just having flat feet, if no problems, don't treat. Good, good. So same thing you said before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, having a it's, people always have this image of flat feet are bad. Flat feet are just flat feet. You know, high arches are just high arches. And, and just as many people, you know, plantar fasciitis, people are saying, oh, only people with flat feet have them. The, the same number of people have flat feet as normal arches as high arches. They get almost all of these conditions. But now we're talking about flat feet that people just are born with, just genetically flat feet. There are conditions in the ankle. Um, one of the tendons are on the inside part of the ankle. The posterior tibial tendon can go bad. And you get an adult onset flat foot. So you have a normal arch that all of a sudden becomes very flat. That's a different story. Those views are painful and orthotics are good at managing that. Gotcha. Good to know. Good to know. Can you talk a little bit more about tendinitis? This person says they were diagnosed about six weeks ago and it is no better. Um, depends which tendon, but yeah, generally speaking, if they were just diagnosed with it, uh, you know, what, what did they do to treat it? Um, if they're just told them to go ice it and rest it, if it's not getting any better, you know, you know, the next step is usually, you know, if it's the Achilles, maybe a little heel wedge. Physical therapy is almost always the next step if tendonitis doesn't get better. The exception being if it really hurts to walk. So if you have tendonitis and just going to the, you know, going to the store is painful or just walking, you know, a block is very painful. It's hard to rest it in without just lying in bed for two or three weeks. Then we put you in a walking boot, which is a way to rest it and let you kind of go about your normal activities. So if six weeks is not getting better, whatever you're doing, you got to go to the next level, whether that's immobilizing, a boot, um, you know, is it an MRI? It kind of depends on what tendon it is, but I would go back and talk to whomever and say, it's not getting better. What do we do now? Good, good. Very good suggestion. Can a dislocated ankle contribute to an Achilles tendonitis? Well, a dislocated ankle is extraordinarily rare. So I'm, and if you've dislocated your ankle, I mean, that's gonna lead to a whole host of other problems, but we're probably not talking about a dislocated ankle, maybe a bad sprained ankle, because a dislocated ankle is, I mean, you're in the emergency room and ambulance is coming to get you if you ever had that. And it's less, but it's not, and if you did have it, you're probably not gonna end up with Achilles tendonitis. You're gonna have a whole host of other issues with the ligaments and the stuff inside the joint. But the Achilles probably is one of the few things that wouldn't be infected by that. Um, but I'm guessing that it probably isn't a dislocation because I think I've seen two pure ankle dislocations in all these years. It's so rare. Okay, okay. So maybe that person should get, should get some more answers from somebody yeah, who's seen that. I, mean, I think you have tendonitis and just address the tendonitis. I don't think whatever happened to the ankle, if there was an old ankle injury, is the, is the culprit. Because old ankle sprains and, and, and a dislocation is really a ligamentous injury. Um, it's going to lead to some chronic ankle instability and some sometimes loose cartilage in the joint. But the Achilles tendon probably isn't going to be involved in any of that anyway. Okay, good to know. This next question asks, at what point should you have surgical hardware from an ankle surgery removed? 
is some pain normal? Um, the answer is generally we, again, for broken, if I assume we're talking about a fractured ankle, I usually tell people maybe 5% at the most of people who have a broken ankle ever remove the hardware. You never have to. I mean, there is no indication other than occasionally a very young person will take it out because they're very young. But other than that, the only reason we take out hardware is if it's causing problems. And that's generally, if it hurts, if we're talking about a plate on the side of the ankle, if it hurts right on that plate and it bothers you enough, it can be removed. If you have a plate in there, but the pain is not over the plate, taking the plate out probably won't help. And then the pain may be coming from, you know, again, if you broke an ankle and needed surgery, you might have some arthritis in the ankle that's setting in. Um, but we only take the plate out if it hurts basically where the plate is. And that's 5% of the time. There's no harm in removing it, but there's, you know, some people, you know, doctors take it out 100% of the time. I've seen ankle plates that were, you know, eventually we take them out 20 years later. They don't rust. They don't change. They look as good as the day they were put in. There is wow. no problem in having them in forever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any tips for Morton's neuroma? Uh, there, I mean, there's two things you can do for Morton's neuromas. I mean, generally, well, there's three. Orthotics with what's called a metatarsal pad, um, which is just like a little bump in the orthotic that goes kind of a little bit further towards the arch that sort of unloads that area. Oh, I talked about for the person who had the callus. That's the same sort of metatarsal pad. Um, cortisone injections are, are, are pretty effective and probably 75% of the people one shot takes care of the problem. Um, some podiatrists will inject alcohol. I usually don't, I don't do that, but that's a different type of an injection that can be done. And then surgery is a last option. I mean, a small percentage of people, if it's a neuroma and it doesn't get better and it hurts enough, you just take, you can take the nerve out and that probably solves the problem 95% of the time. Okay. Okay. All right, it looks like we only have a few more. If the Achilles is inflamed, does that have any bearing on movement of the foot from side to side? It shouldn't. The Achilles is what helps move the ankle kind of up and down on um, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Um, right. Side to side is really more ankle ligaments, subtalar joint ligaments. It shouldn't. Doesn't mean it couldn't indirectly, but if you're having trouble with in and out movements, it's probably something in addition to the Achilles tendon. Okay, great, great. And the questions aren't in order, so I'm just looking to see if I missed any. Um, lots of people have, have asked a question and then said, thank you, it was already answered. So thank you for that, that's really great. Um, this one says, no questions, just a comment. Thank you, Dr. Waxman and moderator Karen. Very informative, Tracy and Scooter. Uh, <laughs> That's my. Oh, you know what? Someone has a question about tendinosis. They didn't mean. I, I apparently I read it incorrectly. They said the question was about tendinosis, not tendinitis. Do you want? To, do you mind explaining the difference and and maybe yeah, address? Yeah, not that much of a difference. Tendinosis. You know, if you get an MRI, there's certain changes within the tendon on an MRI. Um, it looks like scar tissue or just signal changes on an MRI. So it. Tendinitis is more an inflammation of the tendon. Tendinosis is almost like a degeneration of the tendon. But the treatment is the treatment regimen is going to be the same as tendinitis. Okay. Okay. Good to know. And the person who asked the question about the itching said, "Then what is the itching that occurs 24/7?" That's hard to say. I mean, it depends where it is. I mean, if, I mean, if there's no overlying, I mean, like athlete's foot can itch, but you usually see like scaliness between the toes or something like that. Um, that's probably something that you would see a dermatologist for. I mean, it probably is not orthopedic, um, anyway, you know, again, pain and itching. I mean, I guess they can go hand in hand. Um, but itching isn't really too much associated with any of the conditions in the foot other than skin conditions, like athlete's foot or fungal infections, things like that can cause itching, but there's a whole host of non-orthopedic things, dermatologic things that can cause itching. Sometimes some neurologic things can cause some itching. But I would say if right. itching is the primary issue and it's 24 seven, um, you can, I mean, you can try some hydrocortisone cream and see if that doesn't help. You can take some Benadryl at night. That can sometimes help if it's related to histamine stuff. Beyond that, probably see a dermatologist. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is walking on concrete? It says walking on concrete or asphalt. Which is better if you have a choice? Neither. I mean, they're both hard surfaces. I mean, for short distances, it doesn't matter. I mean, I would say concrete's probably worse than asphalt. I mean, if you're you know, if you're if you like to walk a lot, I mean, I think walking in like a forest preserve where there's a lot of gravel, kind of crushed down gravel, that's going to be a lot softer. Um, concrete's probably the worst. Um, you know, asphalt isn't all that much better. Softer surfaces are going to be less stressful. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so when you say neither, should people walk on a trail or on the grass? What's no, no, the... I mean, it depends how much you walk. I mean, I, you know, most people can walk, you know, as long as you kind of adhere to, I'm not going to walk seven days a week, 365 days a year without taking any time off. You can go out and walk out in the neighborhood on the, on the streets or on the sidewalks and probably have no problems. Um, is, you know, wearing the right shoes, make sure they have enough cushioning and support and, you know, the body needs rest. You can exercise seven days a week. You just can't do the same activity seven days in a row. So I if agree. you do it in moderation with the right shoe, you can walk on whatever you want. But I mean, if you really are, do, are gonna do a ton of walking on a regular basis, doing some of that on a trail that's a little softer is gonna be easier on the feet. Great, great. I agree. <laughs> As and a personal great. trainer, it's a lot yeah. It's to walk through the trees than it is to walk through the neighborhood anyway. Exactly, exactly. All right, what shoe do you suggest for arch support? Would, would you recommend a new balance walking shoe for arch support? You know, every, every shoe company's got some shoes with support. I don't ever recommend one shoe over the other because every foot is a little bit different. I mean, new balance tend to be wider shoes at times. So some people with wider feet like new balance. Um, and, and not everybody needs support, but I always suggest if you have any questions regarding specific shoes, go to a good shoe store where they can, you know, again, look at the width of your foot and you start with that. If you have a very narrow foot, certain shoe brands, you may want a certain shoe brand, but if your foot is a certain shape, that shoe's not going to be very good. And, and, and they probably know shoes better than I do. I mean, I can give general recommendations, but I don't know every shoe brand, but I do know that if you go to a good athletic shoe store, they're pretty knowledgeable and they can direct you. If you want a shoe with a support, they'll pick out the ones. And then the most important thing with, like I said before, with any of those shoes is try the shoe on, walk around in the store and make sure it feels okay. If you put it on, you're walking around and it doesn't feel good, do not buy the shoe. It's like buying a, it's like my dad once bought a sport coat, think he's going to lose 15 pounds and it'd be great. And that sport coat was in my closet within six months and he never wore it. Yeah. You just, you, yeah. you can't buy clothes hoping to lose weight. You can't buy shoes hoping to stretch them out. Right. And, and it used to be, remember, people used to say, oh, you have to break in the shoes. That is not the case anymore. They should fit right out the door. Correct. Yeah. I mean, some shoes you will loosen up and they'll feel a little better. But if you put it on and it feels bad in the store, no amount of it stretching out is going to feel good. Try a different shoe. I guarantee you're going to find a shoe that feels good when you put it on. And me personally, I want a shoe that feels good right when I buy it. I don't want to. And especially if you're spending a lot of money on these shoes, you don't want to take a chance because most of the time that's not, you're, they're going to sit in your closet until the Goodwill guy comes and then they go to a paper bag and they're gone. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Here's one more. When my 18 year old son walks, his feet click. It doesn't seem to bother him, but you can hear it all the time with shoes on or off. It's been happening for years. Should I get him evaluated? Probably not. I mean, you could just see where it's coming from, but I always tell people we don't treat noise. You know, if you have clicks and noise and it doesn't hurt, then what are we going to do about it anyway? I mean, if I told you I could do an operation, make the click go away, I'd tell you to run away. It's crazy. Right. Um, a lot of people do. They Almost anybody out there can move parts of their body and they're going to click. And I have seen people that have ankles that they walk up and down the stairs and you can hear, they make a lot of noise, but they have absolutely no pain. So, you know, usually think clicking and stuff like that, it's like little nitrogen bubbles in the joint that are moving around. I mean, you can get it looked at and you can try to figure out where it's coming from, from an interest point of view, if you want to know, but generally the answer is probably, you're not going to do anything about it anyway. Good to know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I've heard before. And when, when my clients and students ask me that, that's what I always say as well. Yeah, um, I mean, noise is noise. There's no harm in clicking joints or perfectly normal. 
great, great. All right, I think that is everything. Dr. Waxman, thank you so much. It's clear that you put a lot of time and effort into this. Thank you all for attending. Uh, I learned a lot and had a great time. Uh, I just can't thank you enough for, for all of the good work that you put into this and for sharing your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, well now everyone go out and enjoy this beautiful summer and keep those points in mind and then you will not have to visit me in the office. Sounds great. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.